hair process I did not talk about. We never got to um, like healthcare systems and our regulators and like the social setting and all these things that influence our care. So you don't have to worry about that for the exam. And we will cover that though in senior seminar. So it's not being lost. The content is not being lost. Just it's getting moved to a different course. So <laughs> Um, okay, so here we go. We have 35 minutes. That's fine. Because what do we do? So we calculated the needs and now we're intervening. Now we get to intervene finally. We're moving into interventions, right? We've done all this assessment. We've done it. We did it. Um, what do we do with the needs? So I think we, I already showed this slide a little bit, but um, what do we do? What do we do with it? The needs. What, what do we compare the estimated needs to? Oh, yeah. To skin? Yeah. To standards. Which standards? Okay, so not their estimated needs to the dietary guidelines, right? The estimated needs are another standard. So we're comparing though. So let's do that first. So it's a standard. Estimated needs are standard, right? It's our comparison group for diet recall. Right? So when you analyze somebody's diet, you compare it to the estimated needs, you compare it to the dietary guidelines, you compare it to, well, this, can you tell me? Exam review. What, so when you put somebody's diet information, what standards is it compared to? <laughs> the RDA. Very physical. This is how we remember things. We have to use your body. The RDA. The RDA. What else? The AI. The AI. The AI. The AMDR. Not the ear, because the ear is 50%, means it needs for 50% of the population. So, the dietary guidelines, food patterns, food patterns is important, that's quality, and um, estimated needs, estimated nutrient needs. You have all these standards to compare their intake to, right? Great. Um, now, We've collected estimated needs. What is our comparison for that? So that's the question. Also, how much of the kids actually eat? Okay, right. So here's their estimated need. What are we comparing it to? What are they actually eating? Right? That's the comparison. Are, is it meeting their needs? So that's what's the comparison, right? The hospital diet that we gave them. So the diet they were prescribed, right? So their estimated needs, let's compare it to the diet they were prescribed. Are they matching? If not, we have to change the hospital diet, right? So which way? So the hospital diet compared to the needs, yes, it's actually still the estimated. Hospital diet is still compared to their needs. Their intake is still compared to their needs. I don't know, I'm trying to make too big of a deal out of it. So let's just look at the slide. <laughs> you get it. We're thinking about these things. So the data, our intake prior to admission, what are they eating before? How does it compare to their estimated needs? Their current intake, how does it compare to their estimated needs? The diet order, how does it compare to their estimated needs? Um, and then we also know all the things we just talked about about their diet compared to other standards, which are the BRIs, the RDAs. Data, when we collect the estimated needs, what else are we doing with this? This is like our interpretation. These are our interventions. Now we're going to intervene to make sure the estimated nutrient needs are met. Right? So what are our interventions? What can we do? I just said right here. Food and nutrient delivery. <laughs> these are, seriously, these are our interventions. Food and nutrient delivery interventions to meet the needs. So make sure they get the food. Educate them, counsel them. We're going to do more of that in the outpatient setting. Um, and coordinate care. Make sure the estimated needs are met when discharged from the hospital. So we always have four, we have like four areas to think about our interventions food, the nutrients, like are we get, can we get them more? Educate them on taking care of themselves to get those needs. Counsel them so it's a more supportive environment. Or coordinate care, which includes asking the doctor for labs. Um, referring them to Meals on Wheels, you know, making sure their meal plan at the daycare is going to meet their needs. Lots of things are coordinating with care. 
okay? So now let's think about the food and nutrient delivery intervention. So what do we do to meet, um, meet somebody's needs? What are our interventions with food? Tell your neighbor really quickly. What do we do? Like we get food. I mean, what's the big deal? We get food. Water. <laughs> 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 we do other things. We give mother. I'm so thirsty, but I don't want to drink this. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my water. You guys get some. I should have to drink that. So, this is one of the things we get, right? This is um, what we give. So, I'm going to pour little cups. Who wants to help me pass them out? Yeah. Vegan. She's helping. Somebody else over there. I can give a few helpers. I'm going to pour a bunch of these. So, what, how do we meet somebody's estimated needs? I can't drink this. Here you go. Come on, give it a go. If you can't, I know, no, 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 nutrition, I dietary, you don't have to go into it. But, um, <laughs> sorry. As I said, come on. But just if, if you can drink it, give it a try. Because we should not be recommending this if we don't know what it tastes like. It just has to, like, wave. Right? But my grandma's all about it. Grandma's all about it? My kids love this. They love when I give this lecture because I come home with extra insurance. Oh, it's so hot. It's like a milkshake. Because it's sweet. Keep going. How many more do we need? Lots. It's a bar. I know. I'm sorry. I, you know, it's a hot day. I can't carry ice across campus. <laughs> So, what does this provide? Do we need more? Yeah. Give it a try. Okay, I love your question. How much sugar is in this? 20 grams of sugar in one bottle. Oh, we can pass her So, that's not that bad, actually. Um, how many teaspoons is that? I don't want to read it. Five grams of sugar per teaspoon, right? So, four teaspoons? Um, is it the other way around? So four? four grams per teaspoon. So five, five teaspoons of sugar. I know it's one way or the other. Um, so if the patient is malnourished and needs extra calories, you know, a lot of people say, why would we give them five teaspoons of sugar, right? Three Let's see, that's one tablespoon and two teaspoons. Really not. I mean, I'm going the other way. I, I mean, compared to like cereal, it's pretty much on par with cereal. I'm not saying it's great, but let's let's um, prioritize the needs. This person is malnourished and needs calories. We just need calories. We need calories. This is a source of calories. Can you make your own shake? Absolutely, right? You can make your own shake at home. But this has 350 calories and 13 grams of protein. It's pretty good. Greek yogurt has a lot of protein, and tofu has a lot of protein. You can blend that up in a smoothie for sure. This also has like every vitamin and mineral in there at 25%. So we're not going to be able to do that, right, on our own. Um, but absolutely, there's some dietitians that make their own tube feeding and teach patients to make their own tube feeding and feed it through the tube of real food that they blended. So this is not the only way to do it, but this is the way it's done in the hospital. This is sanitary. This is quick. Um, and so that's why it's, this is why it's provided. Um, and I would just say when we need calories, it's okay. You know, we need... It doesn't matter. Coming the from diet sugar. Diet. Like diet um, diet. There's only one gram of saturated fat. But yeah, there's a lot of ingredients. I mean, I know where you guys are coming from. Even though nobody said anything, I already know. <laughs> <laughs> I already know. Do you know where the aftertaste comes from? Flavoring. <laughs> Vanilla. It's corn, maltodextrin, sugar, blend, the vegetable oils. And it's vegetable oils. I mean, there's a lot of calories in there. How do we get the calories from? Fats. So 
there's 11 grams of fat, you know, yeah. in here. But I mean, the aftertaste is coming from all these ingredients and the vitamins and the minerals. So what do you get to look like this? Is it horrible? Would you give that? Would you give that to a diabetic? So, great question. Would we give it to a diabetic? There are low sugar options. Glucerna is an oral supplement that is lower in sugar and carbohydrates. There are lower carbohydrate formulas for pulmonary patients, like we talked about. There are um, higher protein for some renal patients. There are low phosphorus ones, you know, for renal patients. So there are a variety of oral supplements. This is just the standard, you know, products out there. Um, there's also partially hydrolyzed formulas where the protein is broken down, carbohydrates are broken down, the fat is broken down. Imagine how those taste. But we sometimes give those as oral supplements, and they have chocolate flavoring and things like that. So I used to bring that, but nobody tried it. <laughs> Saved the department $10. Um, okay, so that's, this was $10 for six. Expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. Costco. Costco. Yeah, and coupons. There are coupons. But let's think about it, too. Like, so this is 350 calories. I think one of these is a nice addition to somebody's diet if they need it. Um, and there is some evidence that giving a supplement and encouraging the supplement improves outcomes. Um, and so it's not just about meeting the needs, but you know, this is a quicker, easier way. The amount of time it takes to drink this depends on the person versus like chewing of the food and like you know eating all that food. Pros and cons. Some people really like it and do well, and some people don't. How are we going to maximize compliance if this was your intervention? I'm by no means saying this has to be your intervention, right? But if this was part of your intervention, what's your favorite flavor? There's strawberry, there's coffee, there's vanilla, there's chocolate. Um, there's mushroom. Really? Mushroom flavor? Oh, what do you mean? Oh, you did? Okay. And they, so tell us about it. Who tell? Um, they have culturally competent flavors. So, um, for the vanilla, it just tastes like sophomore because they use flavored, artificial flavoring as a natural vitamin. Um, so they all the flavor labs start to all the that have all the everything that meets the nutrition requirement, and then they put in the flavoring that doesn't uh, adjust and we need to want to eat normally. You know, that's why it's so good. But so then, like, you go to different markets around the world, like Europe, they like they really eat like they have mushrooms in Europe. Wow. In China, they have. For India, they have India, so they have Thai and turmeric. For China, they have red date. Like, oh, wow. Sweet. That's really interesting. But it's all artificial. It's just like right. the right. beyond flavors. So, uh, you know, the, again, so it's like prioritizing that artificial versus malnutrition, morbidity, mortality. So, you know, those are conversations you have to have. Like, this can perhaps help you get the calories that you need. Well, I also saw in a hospital once. They actually did blood that test and like they wouldn't take like your milk for added calories. It's the only way to take it to do that. It's like calories in it. There you go. Right. So calories, at some point we just need calories. So any calories will do. So um, okay, so we give supplements. What else do we do? Quiz work in hospitals. What do we do? Yes. Uh if there's an update sheet we can like work with us and do our meal plan that we Okay, good. So we're going to do that in a minute. Meal plan, development. What else? What do we do in the hospital to deliver food? Tube feeding and parental nutrition. So that's coming up. What else do we do? Food. How do we give food? Deliver. We deliver food. <laughs> okay, it's hot. So here you go. So these are some of the things we do, and you guys are going to be even more creative and we're gonna do more things. Um, so we provide a diet, a diet order. So I'm gonna pass this out. Just look at the back page right now. So there's a variety of diets in the hospital, right? The house diet, the regular diet, the diabetic diet, the renal diet, cardiac diet, mom's diet, healthy mom's diet. If you have a pregnant woman that is a pregnant woman that's in there for a long period of time, you wanna make sure she's getting the calories that she needs. Uh, and 
so we have a clear liquid diet. We have a full liquid diet. All those diets. Dysphagia diets, right? Um, so look at the back page. Every hospital has a. You need more? Okay. Oh, there you go. Um, every hospital has the nutrient analysis for their diet on average for their menu cycle. Some coffee. So this is the nutrient analysis. Are there extra? Yeah. So here is a really important thing. Going back to, um, you know, what do we do with the estimated nutrient needs? Does the hospital diet order meet the estimated nutrient needs? These are the estimated nutrient needs. We always compare that person, that patient that was 6'3", or 6'2", that had the femur fracture and the laceration, he needed 3,000 calories a day. Well, if he goes on a regular diet, if he doesn't have any of these other medical concerns, let's like look down this list. A soft diet is for somebody that needs soft food. Difficulty chewing and swallowing, or they just don't feel well, they have nausea, um, you know, they're older maybe, just softer, moist foods. A mechanical soft chopped diet is when the protein is chopped. So smaller bites, they can't use utensils, again, chewing issues. A ground diet is the protein would be ground and minced. So again, same thing, but even more severe, right? Puree diet is somebody that is having difficulty swallowing and chewing completely, and they would be at risk for um, dysphagia and pocketing their food and their cheeks so they chew and chew and chew and chew and never swallow because they're scared of swallowing because it could go down the trachea instead and lodge into the lungs um, and they choke um, or just a little bit can get in there it's called aspiration pneumonia where an infection starts to occur in the lungs so if you're ever thinking somebody can't handle a regular diet because you see they're pocketing their food, they're never swallowing their food, they're drooling, saliva's coming out of their mouth, they're gurgling, very gurgly voice. Those are signs of dysphagia and um, you need to get a speech language pathologist evaluation where they'll do a swallow eval and get different textures and uh, textures and consistencies of food and see how they handle it and then the speech language pathologist decides should they be on a puree diet or uh, a ground diet or a minced or ground, sorry. Um, and what kind of liquid should they be on? So we have liquid, right? But then we have honey, nectar, and pudding consistency. So nectar, how many of you have had nectar before? Nectar is like a little fruit, fruit puree. Kind of think of like a blended fruit, but still pretty thin. And then we have honey. You guys can imagine what honey thickened liquids look like, and then pudding is solid. So those are our different liquid consistencies that the speech language pathologist determines. We don't determine that consistency, but we work with them once they say, yep, they need to be on a honey thickened liquids and a mint dysphagia diet. Oh, is that a huge difference? But I'm wondering how long from chop to puree for calories are these people? So it could be um, different foods completely. So the puree, they most hospitals don't take a tray and then puree it and put it there. They have a separate menu that's a puree menu that they put on. Uh, so diabetic, LC, low, oh, di diabetic low calorie probably. Heart healthy, low salt. So heart healthy would be your cardiac patients, renal, vegetarian, pediatric, full liquid, clear liquid. So anyway, so you can see there's a variety of diets. So if somebody, your patient, again, he doesn't have a medical condition, right? So we're gonna give him the regular diet. He needs 3,000 calories, but this diet is only gonna provide 2,300 calories and 118 grams of protein. So are his needs being met? No. No. So then what do we have to do? <laughs> we need to adapt the diet with more or less food to meet his needs. So that's an often overlooked step. 
this doesn't mean these diets don't meet everybody's nutritional needs because nutritional needs are individualized. These are diets for you know everybody in the hospital. They're baseline. So then we need to adjust it. So how do we adjust it? Let's give large portions, right? Please you tell the kitchen, give large portions for this guy that needs 3,000 calories, let's pretend, right? Let's give, um, well, addition of snacks. Let's give him more snacks. So meal, snack, meal, snack, meal, snack, maybe, right? Are you then just gonna be like, oh yeah, we gave him snacks, we're good? No, you have to see how many calories are in that snack. So when we say snack, it's usually a sandwich, or an insurer, <laughs> um, or pudding, pudding has protein in it, um, something like that, right? Um, not related to this case, but frequency of meals. If your patient is, did we go over this already? No, okay. So, like I meant last week, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, we already talked about this. So, frequency of meals, say you notice your patient has, remember the nurses record what percent of meals are consumed at every meal? 70% of their breakfast is eaten and only 30% at lunch, 30% at dinner. Well, they've got an appetite perhaps in the morning. We need to ask them, why are you eating 70%? Well, I just love eggs. Well, maybe then we'll adjust, we'll take food preferences and make sure we get eggs later on in the menu. Or he says, I am really hungry in the morning. So, you know, we're gonna put more food on the breakfast platter. Right? This is how we're maximizing and meeting our estimated needs. Um, so, yes? Just that we pretty much just focus on calories and protein. Um, we assume, and it's not just an assumption, over seven days the micronutrient needs will be met because these are menus planned by nutrition services and we have regulators and they have to be nutritious meals, right? So with a standard meal, the micronutrient needs will be met. Now, if they need more micronutrients because they have wound healing and we know there's some nutrients that individuals might need more of, then we can give a multivitamin mineral to do that. We wouldn't like give an extra eight o'clock. But maybe we should. <laughs> uh, but that would be expensive, right, for the hospital. So they would just give a multivitamin. Um, okay, so distribution of food groups meet patterns. So this is outside of the inpatient, but what do we do? Somebody's only eating ice cream in the outpatient setting, we're gonna compare it to the USDA food patterns. Food preferences, we just talked about that. So why is the patient always leaving behind the dinner roll, right? So they don't want the dinner roll, but the dinner roll has 200 calories and we're banking on him eating those 200 calories. So let's get rid of the dinner roll, say no dinner roll, and instead give him whatever he wants. Let's ask him what he wants. Um, so that's what we do with the diet. We give supplements. This could be our macronutrients, or we can give micronutrients. Texture we talked about, right? The different textures that we can give in hospital. Um, and parental nutrition. And then this is really important and goes often overlooked as well. Somebody's meal comes back, only 30% is eaten every time, well maybe they need some assistance. Maybe we need to write the order, please have sit patient up. Like patients have a difficult time with the bed. You know, maybe patient needs to be sitting in a chair. Let's please have the patient sitting in a chair for his meals. Um, or menu help. Like some hospitals you can order what you want and maybe this patient is having a difficult time doing that. Feeding assistance, we can order to have somebody there to help feed the patient. Um, set up the meal. Please make sure that you open all containers. This happens so often, the nurses are so busy and the nursing assistants are so busy. So they bring an insurer, but the patient can't open it. It's not gonna get consumed. So we have to make sure it's available for the person to access. And then, we have to ask, why aren't they eating? If they're only eating 30% of their meals, well maybe odors are getting to them, the lights, distractions. So we need to think about all these things and make suggestions for improvement and then follow up. These are our interventions. It's more than just giving this diet. You know, we did all this nutrition assessment. It's more than just saying like, oh, here's a regular diet. How boring that would be, right? So we get to really go see the patient, see what's going on, make Adjustments to maximize that patient's interest. Intake. We have to take an interest. 
a true vested interest in our patients and want to improve their nutritional status and make all these accommodations. Um, Usually you do it within the scope of the kitchen, but Mary has shared that with her pediatric population, she'll get the chef to make like special meals for some of the kids. I think it's not all the dietitians like that because she's, she's like favorite dietitian <laughs> and it's everybody's needs. But um, but yeah, it depends on your you know it depends on depends on the limitations of the hospital. Usually we just take food preferences within what we have, but there are often meals from the day before that hadn't been eaten and they're still good. So maybe they liked yesterday's dinner, right? And there's always sandwiches and alternatives. You work in the hospital, right? Yeah. Don't you work in the hospital as a diet assistant? Uh, well, I work with like food surveys and stuff. Oh, okay. For like their meals. Nice. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, I thought you could share with us how what, how you see it working. But yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. What's your question? <laughs> I forgot my question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. When it comes back to you. <laughs> who does share? Who works as a diet aid or assistant? And has seen the mechanics of all of this in the hospital. Wait, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, some hospitals they do like the meal ordering. So then I was like wondering, like, how do you control their like calories they eat? Because they can order like the top of like, cookies and things. Yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Does that have a really good answer for that? So um, if it's important to know, then we would do a calorie count and see exactly what they're eating, right? Um, so what if they only order like some really small food item? So who's, who works as a diet aid? Have you seen that? Like they only, yeah. And, do you have an answer? Oh, yeah. Okay, so say they say, I only want a glass of milk, right? Um, does the kitchen throw more food on there? Or do they just send up, I'm sure they don't just send up a glass of milk. Um, so the facilities that I've worked in, there were preset menus. There was not the patient like select, you know, select what you want. Um, but I'm gonna find out because that's a really important question. Yes. Yeah. So like, do I patients come back like in the evening? So if you need to, you should. So if you have a at-risk patient, you absolutely should go and try to see them eat a meal or at the end of the meal and catch their tray. And that would be like energized, motivated, you know, vested dietitian. And that's the dietitian I want you all to be. But often it's, we rely on what the nurse says and we just kind of go with that. And that's not as good, it's not as good. Because then you can't do all these other things. So you really should go see the patients if you if you can. But you might have 10 patients, you might not be able to do that. But right after lunch, you could do a quick scan of the floor, right, yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. What if like the patient's family comes and then they eat part of the yes. meal, so how does that affect? Right, so then you see the nurse says they only ate 30%. So you always say you see that. You always go talk to the patient. What happened? And then you see the wrappers. Or you see the family and you ask them, and so then you aren't going to get a perfect calorie count, but at least you know they're eating, and you can ask them what they're eating. So it's always good to ask questions. So how is it? You know, what are the mechanics in a hospital? Uh, so the dietitian dietitian suggests a diet based on the assessment. So we suggest a various diet, and we're going to make modifications to the diet to individualize it. The doctor writes the diet order. So in most, in California, we haven't um, been approved to write our own diet orders yet. Um, so it goes into the medical chart as a medical order. The kitchen gets that order. The kitchen prepares the food. The nutrition assistant and the diet uh, tech checks the tray. So there's a tray line where all the trays are coming out with the room numbers on them. And they make sure that the diet order is correct, that room 402 got a renal diet without a salt packet, or that this is a consistent carbohydrate and there's only three starches on this meal tray. It's a fast job and you need good eyes. How many have done that? Has anybody worked tray line? Nobody? Yeah. Any experiences you want to share? Uh, uh, so I was like a volunteer at the diet center and I got all confused, so I would call the nutrition assistant and I'm like, 